Hola, hi, my name is Norm Vaughn and I come from Calgary, Alberta, which is located in the western part of Canada. From my perspective, the most beautiful part of Canada with the beautiful mountains and the natural lakes. I've been fortunate in my life to be involved in many things. I was a, a geologist with a, a major American oil company. Um, I've had opportunities to teach children um, in northern Canada, uh, to teach um, English in Japan. And I think what I enjoy the most is, is for about the past 20 years, I've been able to teach in higher education as a professor in education, helping prepare young students to be future teachers. Over time, my research has evolved and one of my primary areas right now is blended learning. And I'm excited. Um, at the moment, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to travel to the Federal University of Sao Carlos, where I'm engaging right now in collaborative research. I'm sharing my experience um, with the faculty and students at the university, but in return, I'm receiving rich information and ideas and experience about the importance of community and how to foster and create that sense of community in the online and distance environment. Just it's interesting how many of us come to the teaching profession. For me, I came to the teaching profession from the petroleum industry. In the petroleum industry, I was called what was a corporate trainer. I was paid to train people about geology and how oil is created and how we extract it, we get it out of the ground. And I like to talk and I really enjoyed the corporate training environment and I enjoyed talking, talking at people. And so when I had an opportunity to do my PhD and become a teacher, I was excited about the opportunity to get a chance just to talk every day to students. I would have an audience and I could share and I could talk and I, I could give them information. I was very discouraged though. I was very excited. I thought I was passionate when I was talking, but I noticed over time the students looked very disinterested. They looked bored, they looked sleepy, and as the semester continued, fewer and fewer students were coming to the classroom. I became very concerned about this and finally one of the students who was coming and was in the front row, I took her for coffee after the class and I said, what's happening? I'm, I'm so excited about this course and why are the students not excited? And it took her a few moments to share. I, I think she was, she was hesitant. Um, she wasn't sure I was her teacher, but finally she said, uh, your class is very boring. Um, none of us find a space, none of us, there's no voice for us in your class. All you do is tell us things and then you want us to tell you back those things on exams. She said, I, I think you need to change. You need to allow us to contribute, to be more active in the class. And this took me a while to think about this and I was very fortunate. There was another doctoral student who was doing his research. His name was Dr. Terry Anderson, who was a, a leader of distance education in our country. And he sat me down for coffee and he explained to me this idea of teaching rather than teacher presence. He said our idea is to engage, to empower everyone, to help students learn to take responsibility for their learning, to teach themselves. That's the ultimate goal of universities. And he explained to me how teaching presence could work, how I needed to be the captain of the ship. I was still the leader, but as the course went on, I needed to share more of the responsibility for students. I needed to give the responsibility to students in ways that they could contribute to online discussions. I needed to create time within the classroom for students to talk to each other, for students to do role play. So it was very an exciting time for me. I'll be honest, at first it was very difficult because being a teacher, I was in control. And when I engaged in this sense of teaching presence, sharing with students, I was not sure where it would go. It seemed like the classroom was getting very loud, but it seemed like the students were excited. They started to come back to my class, coming back to the face-to-face -face and coming back to the online discussions. So I'm learning, it's, it's a I'm learning continual process for me, this idea of teaching presence 
which means sharing the roles and the responsibilities for the design, the organization, the facilitation, and even the leadership of the course with those students. And again, it's taken me time, but as I've gained more experience, I'm trusting the process and the smiles on the faces of the students and the excitement in the classroom is what's sustaining me in my teaching practice this moment today. Now, what's very interesting for me is about 15 years ago, I was introduced to the Commute of Inquiry framework by my doctoral advisor, Randy Garrison. Now, while Randy indicates that he's the one who, who came up with the term, he's very clear that this framework originated with an American philosopher, John Dewey. And the heart of John Dewey's work was experiential education, is that we learn by doing. By being in our environment, we generate questions that we want to explore, we want to share ideas, we want to test, and we solve problems. So it begins with this sense of experiential learning and this sense of curiosity of questions. But like we all know, learning doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in partnership with others. And this is where this idea of social presence comes in, that we learn in a community where we're able to share, contribute, and learn from others. The third part of the community of inquiry framework, the first part again is cognitive presence, this idea of inquiry or curiosity. The second part, the social aspect of the community. The third part is very important. If it's going to be a true community, everybody must be able to contribute to that community, not just the teacher. As the students gain more confidence in the community, they should be willing to share more and to take risks. And again, this is key for helping them learn how to learn. Now it's interesting, I think all of us in life are exposed to different ideas and, and different ways of, of, of looking at the world. And it was very exciting for me about 15 years ago to have the privilege of doing my doctoral studies. And I think for all of us who've been graduate students, it's a real privilege because we're given the time, the opportunity to think and really observe our world in a different way. And when I was beginning my dissertation, community had always been very part, an important part of my learning process. I'd been fortunate to teach for a number of years in very northern and remote parts of Canada with our indigenous or native people, the Inuit people and our, our Dene people. And from them I learned the importance of learning together. So I had this idea that it's important that we learn together in community and as I read, I was exposed to all sorts of different frameworks and models. There was a frame that was coming out of California from Etienne Wenger, the community of practice um, through his study of workplace learning, how people begin on the edge of a community and as they learn and gain more confidence, they come into the center of the community. I was exposed to the work of Milt Cox in Ohio in the United States around faculty learning communities, how faculty and teachers could learn in groups together over a whole year. But what really got me excited was when I was introduced to the community of inquiry framework. And why I was excited with community of inquiry is not only was it a sense of community, but it was focused on solving problems. So it was wonderful that we were able to get together, but we were action, we were doing something. We were working together to solve problems. We were working together for each other to empower the community. The sum of the whole was greater than the individuals. I remember my days as a student, and I think often as teachers, we teach how we were taught and we teach from our, our own experiences. And I just remember being a student and, and not being very excited about learning. Actually, I'll be honest, in English we say bored. I, I just wasn't happy in class. It, it wasn't exciting. It wasn't engaging. I couldn't find my passion. I was bored. So again, I was so privileged when I had an opportunity to do a doctoral dissertation to spend time reading the literature about engaging students. And as I read more and more about engagement, it just wasn't engagement, 
It was empowerment. It was about helping students find their voice, helping all students in a course, a program at a university, finding their place, helping them develop their self-confidence so that they felt they could contribute to others. And I found there were three keys, three keys to student engagement or empowerment. The first one was relevance. Students had to be able to connect their learning to who they were. So I think a big part of university is helping students find out their identity, who they are, and how they can connect the learning to who they are as a student, their identity. The second item I found was this sense of rigor or challenge. I think all of us, whether we're playing Pokemon Go, a game, tennis, or we're watching the Olympics, we like a challenge. We like to solve a problem. We don't like it when it's easy. We don't remember when things are easy. Our best stories are in life, are when we overcame major challenges. So I think that's the second thing we need. The first is relevance, that students feel they're connected to their learning. The second is that they're challenged and they're excited when they overcome these challenges. The third component of engagement for me is relationships. Again, similar to the community of inquiry framework, we're not learning alone. We're learning in the company of others. We're contributing to the learning of others and others are teaching us and helping us with our growth. And I think this is really an exciting time we live in because again, we have relevance, we have rigor, but we have so many wonderful opportunities to establish and sustain relationships, not just in classrooms, but beyond classrooms with all these wonderful online social media tools that our students are already familiar with. So for me, the heart of a learning experience for both the student and for me as a teacher is an engagement. And it comes down to creating an environment that has relevance, rigor, and relationships. I'd also like to chat with you about assessment. It's interesting. Um, from a, a teacher perspective, I'm excited about assessment because, you know, it's my opportunity to find out what students know or don't know. But the more work I do, I realize that students do not have a very positive attitude about assessment. Every semester I ask students to describe one word, just give me one word that describes your perspective, how you feel about assessment. And it's not joy and excitement. The words I hear over and over are fear, anxiety, stress, and judgment. And I'm not a psychologist, but when I hear those words, it's often like an animal going into its shell. It's not opening yourself up to new ideas, it's closing yourself down. So I think it's very important that we have a conversation with our students about assessment because we as teachers usually use the assessment procedure that's most efficient and effective for us. And often that means examinations where students are filling in little blanks with pencils and we're doing scantrons. It doesn't take us much work. So this is where we need to have a conversation with students about how can you, how can we, how can others give you meaningful feedback to grow and develop? As I mentioned previously, I'm a geologist. I come from what we call the corporate world. And when I was working for this large petrol company, we had 360 degree feedback. We had to give ourselves assessment. We had to give our peers assessment. We got assessment from our boss, which would be like the teacher. And we often got external assessment. So I thought, why can't we do this in higher education, especially with the amazing digital tools we have? In terms of students giving themselves self-feedback, we've always had journals, now we have blogs. Why can't students use digital tools like blogs to reflect on their learning throughout a course? In Moodle, we have all kinds of opportunities for online quizzing. Why don't we use these? Students can do these quizzes over and over and over and over again and make mistakes and it takes nobody time. They get instant feedback and we can actually see the results in Moodle. So there's this opportunity for students to have self-reflection. And again, I think learning to reflect is so important for learning how to learn. The second thing is, and I really emphasize the idea of peer feedback, not peer evaluation, peer feedback. 
teaching students how to give meaningful and constructive feedback to each other so that they're learning to teach each other. They're not learning to evaluate and mark, but feedback. And again, there's so many wonderful tools we can use out there. For example, Google, Google Documents, we call them wikis, collaborative writing tools where more than we can have more than one student at a time writing and giving each other feedback. So we have self-reflection, peer feedback, and I think for teachers, this is where we need to change a little bit. Again, time is always of the element, but too often we give students what's called summative assessment, which are the grades, the marks. And I've done this before. I've written a lot of comments. I've spent a lot of time reviewing a student's essay, but the only thing that she looks at is the mark at the end of the paper. Doesn't look at any of my comments. So again, using digital tools, are there ways that I can give students formative feedback? I can give them feedback on their learning process, just not the product at the end. And last but not least, are there ways that we can use the community, experts in the community. For example, video. It's so easy now for students to create a video about a product they created or about a presentation they're making. And using secure ways, we can then get community members to view these videos and give feedback to the students. So I think what's important is when we're working with assessment is to get students involved in the process so that they can see assessment is to help them grow in development. It's not to punish and just evaluate them.